that. Uh, 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 let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Sami Saliglu. Uh, he's an associate professor and a David R. Charlton faculty fellow at the University of Waterloo. His research focuses on developing systems for managing, curing, and doing analytics on graph structure data. His main ongoing system project is Kuzu, which is a new graph database management system that integrates normal storage, indexing, and query processing techniques. He holds a PhD from Stanford University and is a recipient of the VRDB uh, 2018 Best Paper and the VRDB 2022 Best Experiments and Analysis Paper Awards. So with us, we have uh, our uh, Nebula Graph community members, uh, most of which are contributors to the Nebula Graph databases. And we also have some friends from the uh, academia in general. So let's welcome Professor Sami and let's give the floor uh, to Professor Sami. Well, thank you very much, Shantia. Uh, for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to 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 my talk um so i'm going to be talking about uh, our new uh, data graph database management system kuzu and i'll i'll basically tell you a little bit about in the very beginning about our opinion as a research group uh, as a group in general uh, about graph database management systems and a uh, little bit of the history of graph database management systems, something that you know as a as, as an academic at least uh, that I, I i really care about um, then I'll give you an overview of Kuzu and its ambitions and what it, what it aims to be. Um, and then we'll go into a very technical part of the talk where I'll talk about the core join algorithms in Kuzu, uh, which forms one of its performance, uh, essentially, competence te te techniques. Right. So... <clears throat> In one sentence, if I were to summarize, and I'm giving this slide because, you know, often, uh, you know, you are a graph database uh, community, so you may be also put into a similar, similar situation. Um, you know, we are put into a situation to give an overview of what is graph database management systems. And in the field of database management systems, it almost always means, you know, how do we compare against, you know, how do a novel uh, database management system compares against a relational database management system? So I'll try to, I'll try to do, uh, do kind of give you an overview of my answer to this. So the way I look at graph database management system and the way kind of I kind of position all my entire group, everyone in my group is that they are they should be thought of as read optimized database management systems. You know, you can think of them as, you know, relational database management systems at their core, they're all relational. Uh, they're read optimized also, they're analytical. And, you know, uh, what they're really designed for is that, you know, there's several of things and I'll, I'll go through them, but, you know, maybe the, the most important thing that comes to my mind is that they're designed to be, you know, you know, handle workloads that are that have got a lot of many to many relationships in the data set and complex joins over them okay so i'll give you a little bit of uh, sort of context around that you know popular applications you should have at the backs of your mind and you know probably people are using nebula graph for this as fraud detection and recommendations for example where you're searching for some kind of complex patterns but the patterns are over many to many relationships right as a data model you know um you know think you know, we've got labeled graphs so this is the property graph model that was introduced by uh or at least coined by uh, by neo4j the query languages are very much like sql Anything that you see is going to be very sort of a variant of SQL. They're meant to be SQL uh, with certain graph syntax to, to ask certain queries uh, uh, more conveniently in this graph data model. And at the system level, it's difficult to say something universal, but certainly almost all of them have some kind of a join index, often called an adjacency list index. And that's almost always used to perform joins of node records with other node records. Okay, so they're, they're going to have a certain side of storage and query processing techniques that are optimized for essentially using the join index. And almost always, again, think of it as think of the joins happening are essentially many to many to many joins okay their competence areas you know in 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 my view are whenever you're in a situation as an application developer where you need some kind of beyond sql analytical sort of capabilities almost always uh, you know it becomes natural to model your data if you can't tabulate it almost always the next model that you'd want to do to use to model your application data is a graph. You know, it's historically have been like this, and I'll tell you a little bit about how deep this history is. Uh, wave after wave we've had in the history of database management system, graph database, you know, database management systems that adopt the graph model. And almost always it's been the case that where, you know, it, it, it the, 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 the applications that use these systems have always needed something uh, a bit more flexible 
than the, the tabular model of relational model and wanted some capabilities beyond uh, essentially SQL systems, beyond relational systems, right? A uh, couple of these are essentially many-to-many -many relationships. You know, relational systems are not really optimized for this. Uh, a lot of the joins that, for example, that they'll do are primary foreign key uh, because of this denormalized and normalization uh, um, sort of to, to essentially put back records together that have been normalized. Um, one area, again, where graph databases offer a lot of value is in URI and string heavy data sets. And that's been kind of the, uh, the, the, the realm of RDF systems that have been building sort of techniques for that. But it's also kind of other other graph database management database management systems modeled on graphs are also you know supporting those types of you know RDF based applications essentially in in, in, the, in the space of knowledge management uh, very heterogeneous data is another thing where you need some kind of beyond SQL capabilities right kind of parallel to this is in terms of the workloads right the kind of sort of analytical workloads that uh, are supported in these systems, you should think of them uh, as, you know, you need some kind of a, a system that's competent on many to many joints, probably you'd want a, a graph database management system, you want essentially recursion, uh, some kind of recursive queries, you probably want a graph database management system. Recursion has always been a second thought in, 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 in relational systems. It's actually been added very, very late in, in, into SQL, uh, but it's always been kind of a first class citizen in any graph database management system throughout the history. Uh, and one other thing that's kind of uh, specific to graph database management system not supported in relational systems is that if you want the capabilities to query both the schema of your data and, and the data at the same time. So RDF systems are very good at that. Property graphs, not as much, but that's another realm where you need some kind of beyond SQL capabilities, right? So the goal of Kuzu, and you know, I'm, I'm still giving you a background on craft data management system, but I also want to set the context here. The goal of Kuzu as a project, as a system, is to really perfect this feature set, right? You know, for, for like really target these applications, these types of workloads, and have techniques that are really optimized for this and be very competent on, on, on these set of workloads, right? And just the history, again, this is uh, before I get sort of technical in, in, in Kuzu and um, some of its core architectural aspects. Uh, this is something that I find very important for the graph community to understand, you know, because maybe because I'm an academic, I'm especially sensitive to this. Uh, but there is, you know, sometimes I get into conversations where the some people think that the graph database managers are really, really new. Like, you know, that's the, that we that we arised or like the graph database managers arised in the NoSQL wave and they didn't exist before. That's completely wrong. Actually, if you look at the history of database management systems, the very first database management system in history was a graph database management system. Uh, and this is important to understand. And again, I could talk a lot about this uh, in, in a question and answering phase, but, you know, wave after wave, we've had graph database management systems that have been built in parallel to relational system. And not only that, even before relational systems arose in 70s and 80s was the first time they were built, but in 70s where people started talking about building relational systems, even a decade before that we had implemented, humans had implemented graph-based systems, which you could call a graph database model. So on this picture, what I'm, who I'm showing you is Charlie Bachman, who's credited as the inventor of database management systems. He's a Turing Award winner for his contributions. Um, and he built the first database management system in history based on a model called the network model. And on the right, I'm showing you, hopefully, something that looks like a graph, right? And that's a picture from 1962. Uh, describing his uh, Charlie Bachman system IDS. And network is just another term for a graph. And he had a database model, data model, where you had essentially these records that could link to other records through edges. And it was, it was, is, you know, at some level, if you if you look at this with the different data graph-based models that have been built in history, there's a lot of similarities. So these, like our history goes a long, long way. And I, I'm just gonna leave, I won't go through them. I'm gonna leave three links here for those who are interested in the history of database management systems. And uh, uh, in particular, graph database management systems to kind of follow up on these links to read a little bit about the birth of database management systems and Bachman's sort of uh, system uh, and his kind of 
his design. He's got a very nice talk talking about what they were designing in the 60s uh, uh, as a database management system, right? So, uh, so this is essentially just an overview that I wanted to give about graph database management system so that the, maybe the graph community also, some, some of you, um, can follow up these if you if you're interested, but uh, I I want to kind kind of get get across the point that you know there's a long history of graph database management system throughout history that have been built, and you know there's variants of them obviously they're all different, and the last wave is the pro property graph database management system which Kuzu is uh, is is one of right. So here's an overview of Kuzu as a system. Uh, so a good way to summarize what Kuzu aims to be or what, what Kuzu is, is that uh, it's it, you can think of it as the DuckDB or SQLite for graph database management system. So what that means is it's very it's meant to be very easy to install. So, you know, with a single line in, in, in for our uh, Python sort of APIs, you could write pip install and in a couple lines, you could start essentially creating a database and querying it, right? That's something DuckDB kind of perfected. And uh, I think it's a very good way to develop analytics applications. So 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 we kind of bore of that feature. It's embeddable, so no server management. So it's kind of following easy to use approach. And it's meant to be, and this is based on years of research that we've done on a previous project called uh, GraphLowDB. It's meant to be very scalable on a single node machine. It's not distributed uh, and very fast in, in, in performance. And I'll tell you a little bit about the core, core features of Kuzu. So, so, so we aim to essentially integrate a lot of techniques that we have developed uh, or the broader graph community develops into the system to be very highly scalable and highly performant. And we're getting a bit of usability features uh, inspired by essentially DuckDB, right? So that's the space that we want. And you know, if you want to picturally think of where Kuzu wants to fit, uh, we want to be one application domain, at least it's not just not the only one, but one application domain is we want to sit in the middle as a core database management system for building graph data science pipelines. Okay, that's exactly what the DuckDB filled in the general data science, tabular data science. Uh, we want to fill in the same. So where it's embeddable, so and very easy to install, and you can ingest a lot of data from a lot of formats very quickly. And over time, you don't support this now, but over time, maybe even scan directly natively from, from those formats. Uh, without even ingesting, and then uh, essentially feed data into downstream, essentially graph data by uh, graph data science or other data science, uh, other data science libraries, right? So maybe like think of PyTorch Geometric, DGL, graph AI libraries that are becoming popularized, and you want to ingest data very quickly, maybe transform it, clean it query it, extract subgraphs very quickly and feed it into your graph data science libraries, right? So that's uh, essentially an over, overall one, one application domain that we're essentially adding features to target in, in, in Kuzu, right? So a couple usability, and uh, I've got a much denser slide coming after this. In terms of usability features, uh, just to go over them, uh, we support the property graph data model and the open cipher query language. Uh, differently from the data model though, we require a schema, graph schema. So you essentially say, here's our nodes and maybe even call it node tables. You know, we got person node tables and they, these are exactly the properties of those. Whereas in the original uh, property graph data model, that's not the case you could arbitrarily at um, properties. Um, uh, on this. And I can tell you why we've chosen to add a schema. Uh, it's kind of based on our interactions with people who have been developing some of these graph uh, database management systems and some of the users in production. A lot of people almost always have a schema on their graphs. Um, and it's .db in SQLite embeddable, as I said. So you can right now on your machines type pip install kuzu and you will install kuzu and then you could uh, you know start writing a python script to create a database and query right so that's uh, usability features another thing is it's uh, it's supports transactions uh it's uh, serializable transactions uh so you get automaticity and durability and this is based on right ahead logging that uh, we have implemented but it's it's not meant to be uh, very sort of co competent in transactions it's meant to be taken Taking batch updates from time to time, uh, but you know it gives the core database management system features. Right? Uh, is there a question? I hear some. I I heard some noise, but I'm not sure if somebody wants to ask a question or not. Okay. Anyways, so 
let me continue. In terms of uh, uh, some uh, performance features, uh, I can't. It's, it's a very. This is a very dense slide, but and I can't go through all of them. Uh, but if you follow sort of state of the art analytics database management systems and the literature around it, uh, it, it essentially it's based on the state of the art techniques. So it does, for example, vectorization. Uh, uh, it does morsel driven parallelism. So uh, it's a single it's, it's a single node system, uh, but you know supports parallelism and the state of the art way of doing query parallelism is is, is morsel driven parallelism. And I have the link to uh, the paper who kind of described this and it's being adopted by many systems like DuckDB also is morsel driven parallelism and vectorized. Uh, and vectorized here just to, if in, in case there are people who are not familiar vectorized means that uh, operators in the system uh, process blocks of tuples right you take a block of data from yes. for, for example yes. your node properties and you process them at a time instead of tuple at a time which is the more traditional way of uh, architecting query processors so it's factorized i'm not going to say too much about this but uh, right now but i'm going to actually devote a lot of uh, my talk to this uh, it's it it adopts factorization and this is a technique to compress intermediate relations uh, when you do many to many joins in the system. And I'm actually going to devote a lot of time on this uh, and how we have integrated factorization into the system. Um, so in terms of storage, it's, it's a disk-based system. Again, one of the things that we are going for is high scalability. Um, so we've got it's it's a disk-based system with columnar storage, both for the, the sort of node properties, which are vanilla columns, but also the join in the C's and edge properties. They're based on a popular data structure, disk-based version of a popular data structure called um, CSR, columnar sparse. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I forget what exactly is the C st stood for sparse row, columnar sparse row format, I think. Although that sounds a bit uh, com compressed sparse row, compressed sparse row, but it's a columnar, it's essentially a columnar uh, storage structure, very popular to store, uh, uh, for example, adjacency lists in 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 graph libraries. It's 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 a it's a disk based version of it, so it's it's highly efficient for 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 scans of edge properties and 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 adjacency lists. Uh, we support a disk based hash index, which is good for point queries. So on the primary keys of the nodes. You, we have a hash index which allows you to, for example, quickly get neighborhoods of nodes. So we kind of optimize the system to be good at that. And it's got uh, several novel join algorithms that is based on a years of long, years long research that we have done uh, in my group. Okay, and I'll tell you a little bit about both factorization and uh, novel algorithms. Right, uh, it's quite traditional in terms of how uh, we evaluate queries. So an open cipher string text comes into the system, we parse it uh, and then bind it. Then we plan and optimize it, get a logical plan. Uh, this optimized logical plan is then mapped to a physical plan, which through you know morsel-driven parallelism in a parallel way executes executes the query. Okay. So I could stop here because uh, this is the overall sort of core feature set and overview of Kuzu. Um, so if you got questions about um the system overall um or the previous things that i talked about the history of graph database management systems i could take them now because the the next part of the talk is where i'm going to get very technical into the core join algorithms and uh, so it's going to get very technical and i expect to lose several people but at this at, until now it's i've tried to give i've tried to give a quite high level overview of what the system aims to be uh, where we, the kind of gaps that we want to fill and the kind of features we want to sort of perfect as we, as we continue developing the system. So one thing to know is that it's not an academic prototype. So it's based on another project that we, um, was, that was meant to be an academic prototype called GraphLowDB. A lot of the techniques that we have integrated into Kuzu was based on our understanding of how graph databases should be developed over a research prototype, which was never meant to be a usable system, but Kuzu is a lot more ambitious. So Kuzu aims to be like the Postgres or DuckDB, something that comes from academia, but gets users and gets used in, 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 in actual applications. So it has a legacy, has a, has a long living legacy. So that's what, that's what we're going for. So don't think of it as an academic prototype. You can actually start prototyping things and over time it's just going to get more and more mature and we're kind of devoted to uh, making the system really really competent over time right 
So I'm not following the chat, but I see there's a message in the chat. Uh, is there a question or does anybody else have a question? Yeah, in the audience, uh, if you have questions, you can ask, ask the professor. Uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, how you start the, uh, do you have manage the bubble pool? Uh, I see your uh, previous slides said it was a disk based uh, uh, storage. Uh, so uh, when you, the query is running, uh, do you directly fetch the uh, data uh, kind of uh, pages uh, from the disk and do the, do the query uh, query job? Or uh, you have, do you have mm -hmm. a bubble pool? Uh, we have a buffer pool. So we have a buffer, uh, we have a buffer pool uh, for that stores both the sort of the copies of the pages on the disk. So we you know, caches them. And we also have a use the buffer pool for also temporary storage right? um, for that the operators might need. So for example, a hash join operator in the system when it needs sort of space, it gets it from the from the from the buffer manager as well so yeah it's completely managed and you need to essentially if you if you if you try it out if you try kuzad you should give it uh you 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 are you should probably set the how much buffer pool that you want to give to the system um when when you kind of launch it when you create your database object you you get to say how much memory you want to give and that's the, exactly the memory that we're gonna we're gonna use so you're gonna you're not going to use your systems all memory we're going to be very careful about how much memory that we use okay thanks uh, another question about uh, uh, you maintain a csr based uh, uh, index index uh, mm -hmm. uh, as i know csr is uh, is part of the uh, index it there is a csc uh, csr is uh, is about uh, is, is easy for get the outer edge of the or, or the image, I, I, I can't remember. Uh, so do you, you yeah. When right, you're, when, uh -huh. uh, sorry, hmm? I think I interrupted okay, you, but you, I think you, I understand, I understand the question. Hmm. So, um, so, so, so we, uh, so uh, we double indexed edges. So, you know, every edge in the system is double indexed. So we essentially think of it as like, there's a set of edges from source to nodes with some properties. Right, so think of that. I mean, this is obviously a very simplified explanation, but we have a, a, a an edge file that is uh, contains from and to and some edge properties on the uh, on on each edge. So we index that twice: once from the source sort. If you if you if 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 you want to think of that, we sort that file twice and index it using a CSR uh, index. So with actually a constant uh lookup cost and uh, parts of that index so this you know if, you, if you're familiar with csr index i might lose people here but there is actually a, a, a an index part and then there's actually the the part that actually stores the edges which is a lot longer that's why often it's it's drawn uh with a short column and a long column uh this long column is it's completely displaced and this short column is in memory it, obviously in in, in in we keep we keep it in memory and with a single kind of lookup we could go to a particular um, neighbors of a node both and, and because we double index we could go to the backward neighbors and the forward neighbors of nodes okay yeah. thanks and so there is uh so for any of these sort of more detailed questions i have added and I can, I'm happy to, I know I should share my slides. Uh, I have added links to the papers that these foundations of these are based. Um, so, you know, this is again, all, most of these are on a prototype system that we built before, not on Kuzu, the, the papers, I mean, the papers are based on uh, the, the prior system, uh, but the designs, the foundations and the principles of the designs are explained very carefully there. And, uh, you know, anything that I put here, I highly recommend for different graph database management systems to integrate like and I can explain and if there is interest, I'm happy to have longer meetings on any of individual techniques to explain why I'm an advocate for those techniques. And so the, 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 the papers, I'm, I'm quite proud of the papers that, that, that are written here, they're really meant to be integrated into systems. We had a strict concern for practicality in any of these techniques that we that we wrote about. 
yeah, and I'm happy to talk about them. Uh, I mean, individual techniques uh, at separate meetings. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, hi. Hello. Yeah, uh, my, my question is related about uh, the embeddings, graph neural network embeddings. Uh, you said that uh, COSU supports embeddings. So how you store the embeddings? Oh, so that's, sorry, that's a misunderstanding. I didn't say, I didn't mean to say we support embeddings. I meant to say uh, that we want to be the database that's used. So if, if you're building a graph AI pipeline, maybe something that's that essentially feeds data to PyTorch Geometric or DGL, right? Um, so to uh, when you're building your pipeline, right? Maybe you exported some data for, from a relational system, but you, you're going to turn it into a, a graph format and maybe you're going to transform it maybe clean it and you're gonna run some queries to extract maybe subgraphs, right? To, to do that part, you would use Kuzu, but Kuzu natively doesn't support embeddings. So then you could subtract and convert it into the formats, the matrix formats, adjacency matrix formats of these upstream uh, AI libraries. That's what I meant. We natively don't support embeddings. Although if you've got ideas, I'd, be, I, I'd love to hear if what can a database management system do if it natively supported embeddings and I've, I've got actually two master students thinking about this uh but it's too early i mean we, we're not we don't have that feature and it's it's that that is kind of a bit speculative it's it's meant to be yeah, really academic research uh, everything that i'm showing here is not really academic research it's, it's meant to be an actual sort of practical things that we do but it's an interesting thing that i sometimes think about what is the value that a database management system could give if it natively stored embeddings yeah, but we don't do it. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Hello, uh, Sammy. Hello. I uh, think I think uh, someone uh, is uh, saying that you uh, are speaking maybe too fast. Am I? I'm sorry. Um, okay, I'll try to slow down. I have a question. Uh, do you have any special optimization for the multi-steps query? What eggs? Can you clarify what you mean by multi-step? Uh, you will go multi steps from one point to another, uh, another node, then another node, then another node. Multi -steps. Uh, yeah, yes, we have a lot. And actually, the rest of the talk is about some techniques we do exactly for that. Okay. So let me defer the question, but we have a lot. I mean, that's exactly. I mean, our years of research really just optimized how to do fast sort of pathfinding or complex sort of multi multi join queries uh, to link nodes and 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 find patterns in graphs and you know the most common of those is to find long paths for example and we've got a lot of techniques on it and I'll talk I'll talk exactly about that uh, yeah, if I if I guess correctly it's, it's all the things that you already publish uh, mainly about the factorization and like uh, uh, how to detect uh, cyclic uh, uh, paths right Say that again. Sorry. So do we? No, no, no. I, I, I'm just wondering whether all the tech techniques that you are going to cover are actually already been covered by the papers that you of course published uh, in BLDB. That's right. Yeah. So I've got uh, maybe like a, a set of papers in 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 in, in VLDB, ICD, those kind of top conferences, plus another cider paper that covers exact some of what I'm going to cover next, but they're all open. Yeah. And the code yeah, yeah. is you could also look at the code. The code is also open, obviously. Yeah, actually, I, I watched your uh, YouTube video, which you presented uh, for uh, to Pinterest labs. And yeah. I, I remember those te techniques I used to optimize for the like, uh, uh, like multi hop queries, meaning to minimize the memory usage, right? That's right. Yeah. So the, to, to compress the intermediate results, and I'm going to talk about that. And some more from you know some some more optimized techniques for for those type of multi join queries. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Right. So maybe I should move on so that I have enough time for that uh, for this part. Uh, and I'll I'll kind of defer the questions to 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 the end. I think I'm this is a good time that I've got half an hour and I probably need about 20, 20 minutes to cover this part. Okay. So now I'm going to get very technical and I apologize if, if, if I lose people and you could stop me as I'm explaining things because this is a little bit denser because it's, it's going to get a, it's going to get a bit a bit more technical and we're going to get 
core into one one or two techniques that we have integrated. Um, so uh, I'll cover sort of uh, <clears throat> the core join algorithms, the join operators in the system, and what they're what they are designed to do, what our design goals were, and uh, and 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 cover also some of those techniques that I mentioned, like factorization uh, before. Okay. So the first thing that we wanted to do in our, as a design goal was we wanted to factorize intermediate results, and I'll tell you uh, a little bit uh, about this uh, momentarily. Uh, so <clears throat> factorization, what you sh you should think of is it's a compression technique. It's a compression technique to represent results. So in one sentence for now, result, intermediate results as Cartesian products instead of flat tuples. Okay, so it's, it's a way of essentially reducing the representation of an intermediate relation that's being passed between operators. The second thing that we want to do is we, we want to make sure that the system always does sequential scans, except obviously in some in-memory operator like a hash join. Right, uh, which are kind of inevitably through hash joins, you have to do in memory, maybe non sequential uh, reads. But when you scan things from disk, we want to always make sure that scans are sequential. But you know, scans means obviously you only scan uh, node and edge properties. Uh, and uh, we also wanted to avoid full scans of node tables and edge tables properties when possible okay so we, we had essentially three goals that we wanted to make when we designed this right so there's another separate goal which i won't have time to go, get into but i have papers on this and i'm linking them over here uh to this paper uh, the one on the very left uh, we also had a good understanding from our prior research that for certain types of join, which are called cyclic, and in graph terms, it just really means if the if the pattern that's being drawn in Cypher, for example, is cyclic, if you consider the the, the pattern, then there is a technique called uh, based on multi-way intersections of adjacency list called worst case optimal joins. Uh, so I won't get into it, but that was another thing. I won't go into this, but there's a link if you want to find it. Okay. So in this talk, I'm just going to focus on these three goals, right? We want to essentially factorize intermediate results, compress. We always want to perform sequential scans, and we always we want to avoid full scans when possible, right? So let me just give you an overview of factorization and motivate what factorization is, why people kind of in the database community uh, developed this technique, wrote papers about this technique, and why I think it's kind of a must for any graph database management system that wants to be competent on many-to-many -many joins, right? So. <clears throat> Columnar relational systems, which in the relational is it's the analytical version of relational systems like you know DuckDB, vectorwise, MonoDB, Vertica. Now these are optimized for analytical read-heavy workloads, just like graph databases. But they're not really optimized for many-to-many -many joins like graph databases should be. Right? They're really optimized for aggregation-heavy workloads. You get a column, you want to aggregate it fast. For example, sum all the essentially sales very fast. Right? And one common wisdom that has arise from this literature on on columnar relational systems is that um, operators should process blocks of tuples at a time. Okay, so that's called vectorization, and that's a very good thing. Again, systems and analytical systems, including graph database management systems, should also be uh, vectorized. It's kind of the state of the art, at least for now, right? So let me just show you, you know, how this works. You know, suppose this is your SQL query, and what it does is it needs to, you know, it's trying to group by department and find the average age of employees in a department. It's just a query over a single single table, employee table, okay? So maybe your table looks something like this. A plan, query plan for this in a columnar RDBMS like DuckDB is going to look very similar to this. You're gonna have a scan operator, uh, maybe it runs a filter, uh, but it's going to work on blocks of tuples, right? It's not going to work on a single tuple at a time. It's gonna work on blocks of tuples and it's going to perform its computation inside a tight for loop, right? So maybe it's, it's going to scan from the disk a block of, tuples, right, uh, departments and ages, and it's going to run a filter in a for loop, this first scan operator, uh, finding those tuples that pass the filter, which is greater than 30 in this case, okay? Then it's going to pass this block of tuples to the next operator, which is going to perform again inside a for loop, tight for loop, a group by an aggregation, okay? It's kind of very well understood right now, uh, since essentially early 2000s, that this is uh, a, a very good idea 
for modern CPUs. It gives you great CPU utilization, but it's not really optimized for many to many joints. Okay, so and and part of the reason is that it's essentially designed to be passing um, flat tuples from operator to operator. Okay, the fact that it uses flat tuples is actually not optimizing it for many to many joints. Okay, let me show you what the problem is. When you perform a sort of a vectorized, when you develop a vectorized architecture that uses flat tuples, uh, suppose this is this two hop query um, um, that we want to evaluate. It's, you know, uh, what it's asking is, you know, all the essentially two, two paths that some user with a name Liz is part of. All right, so a common plan in a graph database management system uh, is going to look, or, and, and even in a relational system, it's going to look something very similar to this, um, is you're going to scan a block of essentially tuples. You run inside a tight loop, a filter again, to select do, those nodes with name Liz. But by the time you, these extends are the some, some popular sort of uh, join operators in graph database management systems. We had one in the prior system, GraphflowDB. We don't have it in Kuzu, but we had one in uh, prior GraphflowDB system and Neo4j has a similar operator uh, called expand. Um, uh, and all it, uh, basically uh, what it does is it, takes a node and extends it to adjacent to this. In, in database literature, this is called an index nested loop join. So regardless of what, what join you do though, uh, so let me not sort of confuse you, regardless of what join you do, by the time you perform the two hops, because of the nature of the data, that because the nature of the data has got many too many relationships, it's inevitable that the intermediate data that you're going to represent is going to have a lot of repetition, right? So Liz is connected to, in this case, L1, this one node uh, with name Liz is connected to 100 incoming nodes and 100 outgoing nodes, so which means it's part of actually 10,000 uh, tuples, right? So this L2 is the same situation. So there's essentially two, two, you know, <clears throat> 20,000 tuples that need to be represented. And because the representation structures are flat tuples, there's going to, be, going to be a lot of repetition, right? Sometimes this is not value repetition, but some other index repetition. So for example, DuckDB does not actually repeat the lizes, but it repeats something else. It repeats the index of a Liz in, in some other uh, data structure, but inevitable that there will be some repetitions in these blocks that you pass, okay? So, and this repetition really happens because the traditional vectorized processors, they're designed to pass one group of vectors uh, that contain a block of flat, flat tuples from operator to operator, right? So <clears throat> factorization, is uh, a technique to represent uh, relations, tables, if you will, intermediate or you know input or final tables, not in flat format, but when you can, when it's possible, right? When some kind of independence between certain columns exists, to represent them as unions of Cartesian products. Okay, so those exactly twenty thousand tuples that I'm showing you on the left could equivalently, much more succinctly, in a compressed format be represented by using roughly 400 values, right? So I hope this is self-explanatory, but what this is saying is that the first 10,000 tuples could be represented by a single L1 and Liz. So don't repeat it 10,000 times and multiply it by 100 U1 to U, UN, UN, the Cartesian product, multiply it meaning, sorry, Cartesian product it with 100 values, A values, U1 to U100, uh, and 100 C values. And that's because, you know, we can, we'll talk about this in a second, but, you know, A's and C's are kind of given B conditionally independent. And similarly, L2, those second 10,000 tuples could be represented with L2 list, Cartesian product with U100 to U199, Cartesian product with C100 and C99. Okay, so it's much more compactly, right? So it's, this is the insight that this literature had and uh, the person who kind of led the space uh, sort of kind of mid 2010s was Dan Altoanu. He was at University of Oxford, now at University of Zuri. Uh, so, and he kind of figured out the principles of how a system, you know, a, a query compiler could understand when it can factorize um, the intermediate relations that its query plans are generating, okay? Uh, 
So I won't go into this, but at least for this example, I hope it's clear to everyone that for this two path query, once B is fixed, because there are no predicates between A and C nodes, there's no condition in the rest of the query to, to sort of compare some property of A to some property of C. And for every A value and for every C value that matches a particular B, you can actually take the Cartesian product. That is for once B is fixed, A and C are independent. So this is an opportunity to actually factorize and compress result if you are performing joins, okay? So, <clears throat> Uh, the technique that I'm going to show you to integrate factorization into the system, and I'll start kind of with a warm up. It's not going to be what we ended up implementing in Kuzu, and I'll kind of walk you towards what we end up uh, into Kuzu by talking about its its shortcomings. But it's going to get you the idea, give you the idea about how we have developed a, a sort of a factorized query process, how we began developing a factorized processor, and then I'm going to tell you additional optimizations that we did. Right, so. <clears throat> What I'm going to show you is compared to the traditional block-based or vectorized processors that pass a single group of vectors between operators, we are going to pass essentially multiple groups of vectors between operators, and it's going to be done in a very, very light way. Okay, so we call this technique using factorized vectors, right? So here's the warm-up. This is, again, this is not the final thing that we implemented. Uh, but it's kind of it's 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 a it's a simpler way to show you how we end up factorizing and it's, uh, the the intermediate relations when we do multi joins, and instead of twenty thousand intermediate tuples, can use only uh, two tuples with only four hundred values. So much more much more compact. Okay, so this is what will happen in this in this design. Um, <clears throat> so just like before, the scan operator it's exactly the same query, exactly the same plan. Uh, scan operator is going to run in a for loop, uh, tight for loop, the filter, uh, to, I can't see my mouse, sorry, um, to, to, to run the filter on name is equal to list. And then it's going to, um, so, so one thing that I should mention, uh, so with each sort of vector group, there's another field here called current index, and that could take two values. It's minus one, or it could take a non-positive value. And I'll tell you what this means. When it's minus one, it means that the block of tuples in that vector group are all kind of part of the intermediate relation that's being passed. So right now, the scan is going to pass this entire thing because the current index is minus one to extent. Now extent, you know, it's the, this is the join operator. What it needs to do is that it needs to take a particular B value and extend it to its backward A edges, okay, in the query. So what it will do is that it, because it sees that the current index is minus one, right? It's first going to fix this block to a single tuple, right? So at this point, what this means is that there is actually a single tuple in the intermediate relationships in extent. And what it will do is that add another factorized vector group, okay? that is independent from this, right? Uh, where this Liz one, L, L1 will be extended to all of its incoming neighbors, right? So the, and the interpretation of this is that, and, and this these two vector groups will be passed to extend. And the interpretation of this is that what is being passed is a single L1 Liz Cartesian product with 100 values, right? And extend C, needs to extend a particular B value to C, and that's already flattened. That's already the current index is already one. So it essentially just adds another vector group. So uh, that is independent from vector group one and vector group two. And the interpretation of this is that now this is the, we're outputting some data uh, to the downstream sort of uh, application. The, what we are outputting is a Cartesian product of L1 list with 100 U values and 100 C values, okay? And that's a very light way of essentially getting factorization uh, when you're processing uh, processing this query, right? So it's the, the processing is obviously pipelines. So when we, when essentially uh, the computation goes back to the scan, it goes sorry goes back to extend A. Extend A was the one that flattened B, and it had already extended 
uh, L1. So it tries to see, is there another B in the vector group one that was passed to it? So it increments the current index and then extends L2 now to U100 to U199 and extends, then gives this to extend C, which extends to C100, C199. And again, in this processing, no repetition happened, right? Uh, with some index changes, we were able to pass essentially Cartesian products of tuples between operators, right? And kind of very nice thing about this is that if you have already built a vectorized query processor, your operators don't change much because every operator still works on essentially a single vector group, okay? Except extent, which except some of your join operators might have to uh, do additional work to increment the current indices of some other vector groups. But but you know for 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 the purpose of where I am right now in the talk, you can just think of it as like the vectorization architecture of your system never changed. Every operator still works on a vector of tuples, right? So this is why am I calling this a warm up because uh, it still uses these extend like operators which lead to non sequential scans and if you remember our design goals we didn't want to have non sequential scans and let me show you why these extend type of operators lead to non sequential scans right uh, so uh, the common sort of or you know so one common way that joins and scans are done in graph databases, so systems like Neo4j, for example, uh, are through these extent type of operators that might fall that might be followed by with some scan operators, right? And this can actually lead to uh, non-sequential reads, which is very bad if you're ever designing a disk-based system. Maybe if it's an in-memory system, this is fine, but if it's a disk-based system, this could be this is like no system should do this. It's it's very unrobust. Um, so let me tell you what the problem could be. So this extend operator, it's an index nested loop join. Um, and the scan operator, you know, what is the scan operator going to do? So in this query, okay, this is, sorry, I should maybe go through the query because I, I, I've i changed the query. Now it's no longer a two hop query. It's even simpler. It's a one hop query where the A node has a predicate name is list. And we are interested in essentially the name property of the neighbors of A, okay? So it's essentially asking for friends of Liz. Who are the friends of Liz? Okay, that's the query. So the way, a common way graph databases would op, uh, evaluate this is that you would scan the node, find the nodes with name Liz, and then you would extend those tuples to their neighborhoods. Now you've got a set of IDs of some Bs, which are the IDs of the neighbors of Liz, and now you need to read the name properties of those. But reading that, that, that scan B, that name is actually another index nested loop join because now you got these ID tuples, which need to be joined with the name uh, sort of values of them. So it's, it's effectively another index nested loop join operator, okay? And this can lead to non-sequential reads simply because Right, so suppose you know you know there was a single Liz and its ID was seven. It got extended to maybe three uh, neighbors, one hundred seven, five, and fifteen. So think of these as the system level node IDs, right? Now, when you scan the B that name, you know you need to read essentially all over. Okay, so there is no sequential guarantee in the IDs of the neighbors, right? So, that, but the, you know this is essentially <clears throat> not giving you one of our design goals, which it was sequential, always do sequential reads. But a good thing about it is that it actually, these, these type of index nested loop join operators, they can actually avoid full table scans. So if it's like a single node, this is actually not a bad plan. Like if you've only read Liz and it's a single node, doing these three kind of random non-sequential reads might be okay. It's, it's not that bad. So it's, it's actually avoids full table scan. Now, let me compare this to how relational system, every relational system out there would evaluate this query. You know, take, take DuckDB, for example. The common wisdom is to always use hash joins nowadays uh, for, for joins. Now, relational systems, they just, you know, because you're using, using hash join, every scan by design is sequential. There is no possibility for the system to actually create a plan that does non-sequential reads. Like every scan is sequential by design but every scan is kind of like a full table scan right so if you essentially wanted to read so there's a typo here but this should be name is equal to list if you just wanted to find the nose edges that essentially join with list essentially just essentially 
join the Liz record with its adjacency list, you'd still need to scan this entire nose table. Okay, so this essentially gives you the opposite of what index nested loop joins gave. Index nested loop joins didn't give you sequential read, but they avoided full table scans. Okay. So back to our design goals. Now, I told you a warm up of how you could get factorization. So, factorized vectors technique gives you that. Hash joins give you our second goal, right? Perform sequential scans. And index nested loop joins, which is very common in graph database management system, gives you this avoiding full scans when possible. Okay. So, but we don't have a combination that actually gives us all. Okay. So, the core join operators of Inkuzu. They'll adopt this factorized vectors, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you how it does that. And they'll adopt actually hash joints, not index loop join. Kuzu right now does not have any index loop join operator, something like extend or expand. Everything happens through hash joins. Uh, but hash joins are equipped with a technique called sideways information passing to avoid full scans. So that's how we get essentially, we achieve all of these three goals, design goals that we had. And we have two core hash join operators. Right. They're both hash join operators, uh, but we give them different names because you know they're different, and both of them do sideways information. One is called, at least for the purpose of this talk, I'll call an S join, and the other is ASP join. Uh, and uh, and I'll just kind of demo to you what these two modified hash join operators do. Okay, so I'm going to call it an S join, but it's an remember that it's a modified hash join, right? So let's look at a very simple case of how do we do factorized processing plus avoid full scans plus uh, essentially always ensure that we have sequential scans, right? So this is our query. Again, one note query, but um, and <clears throat> we want to essentially, all we need to do is get count the number of uh, Liz's neighbors, okay? So something like this. All that needs to be done is join the Liz record with its edges, okay? So what S join would do is uh, just like, you know, DuckDB, it would scan the, you know, this person nodes to find the ID that corresponds to, node ID that corresponds to Liz and pass that in the build side. So this is a hash join and I'm assuming the right side is the build side. Um, but instead of scanning the entire nose table, what will happen is that after the build phase is finished, we will essentially create, so we'll create a hash table, obviously, to map seven to Liz. But we will create a semi-join mask that identifies which of which part of the nose table that you want to read. And in this case, all of the semi-join masks could essentially be very dense and compact, identifying essentially the adjacency lists of the nodes to scan. Right. So in this case, because only seven was part of the hash table, we only P7 has a one. So that's passed to the scan of the uh, nose uh, table. And in our case, this is the CSR, this space CSR kind of structure that we're, that we're scanning, but we got a semi-join mask, which allows us to essentially skip large chunks of that as we do the sequential scan, right? So we're only going to read seven and its adjacency list. Right? And because it's a CSR-based storage, we can actually directly, when we're scanning edges, factorize the um, uh, neighbors of seven. So the data that will be passed from scan to in the probe side will be seven Cartesian product with three values. And then we all, all we have to do is look up the name of seven. So what we can do at the end of this operation is seven list Cartesian product with 300. Uh, with, with 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 three Cartesian product values, right? So that's what S join does. So this gives us uh, some. This gives us everything we want. It was factorized. It was sequential, and it will be avoided scanning the entire nose table, right? Uh, but there is cases where this doesn't really work, uh, or it's it kind of limits us. So that's why we have a second join operator. Uh, so let me show you this example. So back to the two hop example, right? So we got a two hop where the middle node is list and we're reading essentially the names of the uh, <clears throat> incoming and the outgoing edges, right? So the desired factorization structure that you'd want is that the set of A and names are unflat, meaning that they are sets of values. There would be a single B value, something like Liz, 
okay and then a set of c values so that's the desired structure if you look at the query that's the desired structure that we'd want okay the problem with this with using sort of s join is that whenever you need to essentially grab the names of these unflat vectors they need to be flattened right so that's where essentially you run into a problem with the only an s join like operator in your system right so let me show you the problem um so so sorry these should have been um s join i put a hash join star here but they're 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 essentially simulating an s join so just like before we would pass scan the list and uh pass a semi join filter and we could get this but in the next sort of s join where we want to essentially join the c that ids with the c dot names right you know here is the part where we'd have to flatten the C that IDs and construct the hash table based on C that IDs. Okay, then that's that's where we would lose our factorization structure. The solution we have for this is a three-staged hash join operator that we call ASP join, right? So instead of scanning the built fart built built site first, we scan the probe site. Okay, so we're going to accumulate the seven times one hundred seven, but it will no longer be the built site. It will actually be the probe site. We're going to accumulate it and put it into a temporary buffer, right? Now at this point, we know exactly what which C dot names need, are needed to join with this C dot IDs, right? Um, so this should have been C dot name in the in the in the middle in the middle operator. So we only need to read hundred seven five and fifteenth. Uh, names so we can pass a semi join to the, now the build site and we will construct the hash table of 507 and 15 names and then what we had accumulated from the prop site and put it into a temporary buffer is rescanned so there's some kind of an overhead but everything is sequential to to achieve our factorization structure now 7 times 107 515 is rescanned and is the prop site prop side and all we have to do is join for each c that id the names in the hash table and we can get our desired factorization structure seven times uh, 107 with the name values five and the name value and 15 and the name value. okay that's why we needed two operators right so these are uh two operators and the, the details of this are in our latest cider paper but they're fully implemented and fully fully practical and 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 you can find example implementation an example implementation of this design in inside the kuzu code base right so in the interest of time let me just pass through this uh, uh micro benchmark experiment but again in the paper we kind of demonstrate the benefits of this design obviously there is an overhead to the asp join that i showed you because it accumulates the prop side and rescans it okay there's obviously a choice but everything is sequential therefore it's actually uh, it's actually an overhead systems should consider incurring because it makes your system a lot more robust and able to factorize in a lot more different ways right so that there's a lot of benefit from that either paper so let me pass through this there is i just want to as a last slide talk about a couple sort of set of features that we are <coughs> implementing and these should be done hopefully relatively relatively soon um uh, but i just want to acknowledge the team who's been working on this very hard for uh, for a few years and some other team members who have left and you know please go ahead and give it a shot uh if you find bugs tell us your bugs if you sort of see missing features uh, please tell us and we'll we'll try to prioritize them and here's our github link and uh website and 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 and, and the contact email right thank you very much i could take questions at this point yeah thanks for the great talk any question from the audience uh i have a question here um uh, in your example, uh, uh, your start point is uh, 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 is a name. So you you get uh, you just get one uh, like a primary primary index lookup and find the uh, least least uh, ID. I oh, actually but, that's uh, a good point. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, but when you when your query is like a uh, um. Uh, someone's age is uh, is uh, bigger than twenty, 
then you get a bunch of uh, IDs. Then you, how could you make this, uh, maintain your se sequential scan? Um, I mean, the scan is still sequential. So you, so it's a good point. So if, if, and in this case too, I actually did not assume this scan, this scan, I hope you see my mouse. This scan is a full sort of scan of the person table. I actually, you know, it's true that Kuzu actually, if you ran this query, if name is the primary key would use the hash index. So this would be another operator called index scan. But what I demonstrated is actually it's, uh, scanning the entire table and whatever passes the filter is going to be put into a batch, right? So, you know, if there were multiple tuples, for example, you know, seven times three edges, uh, sorry, uh, I guess I should go back in the, yeah. So over here, if it was seven and Liz and maybe 54 and Liz, they'd all be passed to the S join operator as a block. Right, so it's essentially still vectorized and you would pass blocks of tuples, not a single tuple. And you'd have to hash all of them and your semi-join would be obviously, it wouldn't have a single value. It would have seven plus 57 as one. So you would scan actually two adjacency lists. So, um, but, but I mean, so you, we would still pass multiple sort of factorized tuples and multiple, even from some of the initial scans, multiple blocks, uh, multiple flat tuples to uh, up, upstream operators. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any other question? There's some things in the chat, but I don't know if they are, okay. They're, they're not questions. Uh, as I said, like I'm, I'm very genuine about this. If there is any of these techniques for the people who develop Nebula Graph, uh, for the for the users of the community, I, I highly encourage you to give it a shot. Uh, we are very proud of the performance of the system and we're just going to keep implementing it and make it even better. Okay, so uh, both the scalability and the performance and we are developing this to be like Postgres to, to be usable, like DuckDB to be usable. Okay, so don't look at it as an academic prototype. It is a very serious implementation. I, you know, I am, and many of the people have, who've, who've implemented, uh, we go through kind of serious engineering. Um, so, uh, but I'm also for the people who are developing Nebula Graph, if there is a technique that you find in our papers, we are like big advocates of those techniques. Uh, I'm happy to have meetings, either me or my PhD students uh, who are working or my master's students who, who are working to describe you uh, sort of the technique if you got more detailed questions about those techniques. So some of these things I have been a big advocate of, like worst case optimal joints, which I didn't get into, factorization, uh, columnar storage, why I think graph databases should be columnar uh, and if you got, and there are papers on sort of very detailed designs about, uh, how we think they should be architecture. If you'd like to adopt any, any of those, uh, don't hesitate to contact me, uh, or, or other people in my group. We're, we're more than happy to share, share our ideas and disseminate this, these techniques. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, professor. Yeah. Uh, for Nebula Graph, we have evolved into a stage that we are looking at, uh, very deep organizations on the query processing for graph queries. So we are very interested in your work and we may, um, uh, further arrange some, uh, meetings or discussions with your team. So that is, uh, what we are planning to do. And uh, for the community members that have joined our talk today, uh, we encourage you to try a uh, Kuzu. It has been open source and released in GitHub, I think. And you are encouraged to, to, to try and Kuzu and uh, to to look at your implementations and the papers and to discuss uh, uh, Kuzu and related graph technologies with us uh, in the Kuzu community or in the community. Uh, the it is uh, encouraged. So, any more questions from the audience? Please find our bugs and also feature requests. And uh, I'd also like to just put you on the spot to tell us about Nebula Graph. It's actually one of the systems we haven't studied uh, much. Um, and sure, no problem. we'd love to hear in my group and I'm part of a broader group in University of Waterloo too, uh, a, a large group of database uh, faculty and, 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 and PhD and master students who would love to hear about uh, your system. Right, so yeah, sure, no I'll, I'll be in touch about that 
to arrange a, a talk and seminar on nebulograph at some point. Okay, okay, sure, no problem. Okay, it's already 10 o'clock. If no more questions, let's conclude the talk today and let's thank Professor Sami for its for his great talk and let's get in touch. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, see you. Bye-bye. See you, bye-bye.